It's my honor to introduce uh, Jay Byes today to us. Uh, I don't know if any, if everybody knows him, but Jay's one of our um, anesthesiologists. He works over at the U, or here at the U, and over at the VA. He's been with us since 2012. He um, trained at BYU uh, for exercise physiology, and then went on uh, to Iowa. It's a small university. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but uh, did med school there, and then uh, I went to San Antonio, where he. Um, did his anesthesia uh, residency, and then served a military commitment, uh, worked in the military for a few years, was in Afghanistan for a little while as well, and then we were lucky enough to get him here in 2012 uh, on faculty, and since then, uh, Jay's been really um, instrumental in a lot of ways with, with research. He's, he's been a, a great collaborator with our department. Um, we've uh, worked on several projects together, and it's been great to get to know him, but more importantly, over at the VA, he has a $2.1 million grant um, looking at this, developing a transitional pain service, and then studying its impact, and trying to then institute that across VAs nationwide. And it's because of this, and the work that these guys have done over at the VA, that I, I asked him to come over here and just show what they've been doing, because it's been really um, just instrumental in changing the paradigm at the VA. I mean, the residents of the VA, Kellum, and Jones right now can tell you that it's, I mean, it has absolutely been a game changer in the way that we're treating pain over at the VA. And um, I think that the amount of data that they're collecting is astonishing. And so for the residents, part of the impetus to bring Jay over here was to show you the data that they're collecting. And they're looking for collaborators from our department to, to study this um, in any way, shape, or form. They're doing all orthopedic patients over there now are, are being treated with the transitional pain service in the perioperative uh, period, and and you'll see it's it's uh, it's remarkable. So, with that, Dr. Bice. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. <coughs> I think the mic's working. You can hear me okay. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to a little disclosure. Um, when I went to medical school, I went there intending to actually be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, <laughs> I, I attended, uh, Dr. Salzman may recommend, or may recognize the hospital there. Um, yeah, so I was at medical school at the University of Iowa, and I'm sorry to say that my initial surgical experience, my first rotation I ever did was on the trauma surgery service, and it um, completely cured me of a desire to become a surgeon. Um, and I'm having a little PTSD because I, the last time I was in a surgical grand rounds was actually in medical school. And it was the worst experience I felt. I still feel bad for that poor resident that lost that guide wire doing a central line. Um, so I hope it's a friendly audience here. Um, I did find a way to, to still um, develop a little bit of my closet orthopedic surgery. Um, when I was in the military, I got a career development award um, together with my mentor, Tim Brennan, who's a, a pain specialist anesthesiologist from the University of Iowa, um, to develop a acute pain fracture model uh, in an animal and then study. We, we were looking at um, injecting capsaicin into the fracture site. So I got to develop this fracture model where I took little rats and took an anvil and broke their femur and then had a little K-wire with my manual K-wire driver and, and did an IM nail. And so I got for a little bit of time to be an orthopedic surgeon on rats and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Today, though, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, pain. Jeremy was talking about the transitional pain service. We're going to give a little background, um, kind of giving you the thought process behind how we're approaching pain and how we're, we are uh, approaching the opioids uh, crisis that we have. You mock my pain! Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Princess says, you mock my pain. And Wesley says, life is pain. Anyone who tells you differently is selling you something. I bring that up uh, because I think one of the, the things that has happened in the past couple years, if I can get this to go forward. One of the um, things that has happened in the course of my training is the way that we talk to people about pain and I think put in, inappropriate expectations on that patients had, that providers had, and pain is a big problem. Pain is part of life. I would, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I would expect that for your 
um, elective surgeries, the vast majority of patients that come to you come to you because they're hurting, right? They don't come to you and say, my x-ray looks really bad and I want that fixed. I want my x-ray to look good, right? They come and say, my knee hurts and I want to not be in pain. So can you do something about my knee? And unfortunately, when you actually look at what happens with people who come to surgery and have pain, is although our intentions are to alleviate their pain, the reality is that for many patients, they continue to have pain after surgery that's moderate to severe pain that, that really impacts their life. When you look at the numbers, it's actually quite striking. Even among surgeries that you would think wouldn't be that painful. So inguinal herniorrhaphy, when we look at chronic post-surgical pain, so this is pain that continues past the expected point of when you're healed. And the rates are, are quite variable, but consistently um, quite high. Patients continue for years afterwards to have moderate to severe pain in their surgical site. Knee replacement surgery, same thing. Um, we look at different studies that looked at it. A lot of variability but still a constant message that people who have the surgery continue to have pain after their surgery is healed. And so it continues to be an issue. And this is important because when we look at people who continue to have pain after surgery, one of the things I wanted to bring up here because it plays into how we develop the transitional pain services, when you look at the factors associated with people who tended to have this chronic post-surgical pain, some things, some things came, came to light that were really unanticipated, um, specifically mental health issues. So people who have anxiety, depression, who tend to catastrophize their pain, um, were much more likely to have chronic surgical pain. And this is important because in the acute pain setting, at least, we've never considered addressing this while we're treating their pain, either before or after. And in different studies that looked at this, um, it was consistent. Anxiety, pain catastrophizing, contributes to chronic post-surgical pain. A meta-analysis looking at similar issues, again, found pain catastrophizing to have a significant effect on chronic post-surgical pain, um, together with some other things, having bad preoperative pain, having pain in multiple sites but this consistent message that there's something going on with patients have anxiety and depression that tend to catastrophize experiences that leads them to have a worse pain experience after surgery. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a, in a little bit. The other problem we're gonna talk about are opioids. We've all heard now opioid crisis, right? It's a new buzzword. Everyone loves to talk about the opioid crisis. It came about because people were concerned about the number of deaths that were happening from opioids. Um, which truly is a tragedy. However, I think we're missing a larger part of the tragedy that we don't pay attention to, and those are the adverse effects of people who are chronic opioids um, that include dependence, which is different than addiction, tolerance, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which means that they're on chronic opioids and their pain actually is worse than it was not on opioids. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, it affects um, your pituitary axis. You have endocrine disorders, you have low testosterone um, that affects lots of things, affects bone health, um, growth hormone that tends to make people um, be isolated and you see these behavioral changes with opioids. And then of course you have the more acute changes of respiratory depression and death um, at risk for overdose. We're going to talk a little bit about how surgery um, has been a, a nidus for um, starting new chronic opioid use and people who were previously opioid naive. And then we're gonna go over some of the things that I call opioid myths. So when you look at patients who come to you opioid naive and they have surgery and then become chronic opioid users, there are a handful of studies that have looked at this. This is one that was published uh, last year in, in JAMA that looked at different types of surgeries. None of these were orthopedic surgeries. But the rate of new persistent opioid use after six months of sur after surgery ranged from four to ten percent. For surgeries that would be that are really surprising, varicose veins, right? Why is somebody on opioid six months later after varicose veins? And so you're seeing not only in large surgeries like colectomy that you say, okay, well maybe they have the reason to be in pain for a while, 
but you're seeing it in surgeries that we wouldn't typically think you would have that much pain. And so you need to think, I think, what's going on here? Why is this uh, happening? Perhaps it has nothing to do with pain at all, and a percent of the population when they're on opioids have different effects from them that make it so they really don't want to stop taking it. When you look at uh, hand surgeries, again, another type of surgery that I would think you would heal from and, and not have tremendous um, pain afterwards. Uh, this was a study that looked at over almost 80,000 opioid naive patients who had either elective or um, trauma hand surgery and found about 13% of them developed chronic opioid use. And surprisingly, you would think, I would think that the patients who were there for trauma would be the ones that were more likely to have this issue, but it was actually the elective surgeries that had a higher rate than the trauma surgeries. So again, it makes you wonder what's going on, why is this happening, and can we do anything about it? A study that was published this year um, was a, a review of patients in Colorado that um, had surgery and stayed at least one night in the hospital. So these all were inpatient surgeries and found that among that group, 10% of opioid naive patients developed chronic opioid use after, after surgery. Um, the other numbers, um, pay attention to and remember for the end, they had about 38% of their, their patients that were on opioids prior to surgery. And after surgery, 29% of those patients stopped using opioids. Our own data from the Salt Lake City VA, uh, we looked at every patient that had a total hip, knee, shoulder, or rotator cuff repair. In 2017, there were 215 of them. Our um, opioid rate for preoperative opioid users was about 25% we had about 36% that stopped using opioids after their surgery, 9% that increased their opioid dose after surgery that, that continued to be increased. And at three months, about 10% new opioid users, and at six months, uh, close to 6% new opioid users. So let's talk a little bit about opioids. When I was in medical school at the University of Iowa, as much as I love the school, uh, I, I had lectures as a medical student about pain and how pain's the, the next, the new vital sign, the fifth vital sign, that you should never have an appointment when a patient comes that you don't ask them about their pain. We heard stories about physicians who were sued for malpractice because they didn't adequately treat somebody's pain and that there's nothing better than opioids to treat pain. And it was not right to withhold opioids from patients coming to you that are in pain. And not only should you not withhold them from them, but there's no ceiling. If it's not working, you just keep going up. Right? This is an actual lecture I had during medical school. Um, as a med student rotating with a, a, a family practitioner, I remember very clearly a patient that came in with a complaint of chronic low back pain, and the first line therapy for him was a fentanyl patch. And that's, that's the mindset at the time. That's, that's what was going on that has led us to where we are, right? So we have this in our mind that Opioids clearly are the best medication we have for pain, right? There's nothing that's as good as an opioid when you're in pain. There's nothing that works the same. And that seems intuitive, right? We all believe that. Do you believe it? Right. So when you actually look at data, it's really fascinating going back. You cannot find, despite the development of all kinds of new opioids, you cannot find studies that show that these opioids are superior to other medications for pain. It's not there. You would think for an entire medical population across specialties to entirely change their practice to start using medications that there would be some evidence behind it supporting it, right? It's not there. And in fact, now that we're getting some interest in doing what we should have done 20 years ago, um, looking at studies like this that was published um, this last year, or this year in JAMA. This was a study that was done at a VA hospital where they had patients who came in with um, complaints of low back pain or osteoarthritic pain in their hips and knees, and they were randomized to receive either acetaminophen and an NSAID or acetaminophen and an opioid. And the patients didn't know what they were getting. They, they put them in nondescript tablets. The prescriber didn't know what they were giving. The person evaluating didn't know what they were getting, and they followed them for a year. And at the end of the year, 
they looked at how they were doing. There was no difference in physical function or pain-related function between the two groups. When you looked at pain intensity, using the brief pain in inventory pain severity scale, the people that received NSAIDs and acetaminophen actually had a little better pain control than those that were on opioids. And the people that were on opioids had twice as many adverse related effects, and they were more serious than the ones taking NSAIDs. So is opioid superior for chronic pain? Well, maybe not. Um, a study that was published a, a while ago, 2012, looking at a meta-analysis of different um, interventions for knee pain from knee osteoarthritis, right? And you would think they come, and this is a short-term thing, they have chronic pain, but they're giving them these medications and they're following them for about four weeks, right? They give opioids, and you would expect that to be what they get the best relief from. But if you see the very top part there is um, import, the patient rates it as important improvement in their pain. The middle section is slight improvement and the bottom is minimal improvement. The only thing that had important improvement was intraarticular steroid injections. Opioids were equal with topical NSAIDs for getting relief. So even in the near term for chronic pain, are opioids better than our alternatives? Maybe they're not. But clearly, I mean, chronic pain, right? But acute pain, there's nothing better than an opioid, right? I mean, somebody comes in the ER, broken femur, you're not going to send them home with Tylenol and NSAID, right? That's just wrong. You can't do that. Well, maybe not. This is a study published last year in JAMA looking at patients coming into the ER with acute upper extremity pain, so human <coughs> fractures, shoulder injuries, AC joint separations. And they did the same type of study as what was before, where they blinded the patients and they randomized them to either receive an NSAID and Tylenol or an opioid and Tylenol. Most of them were oxycodone and Tylenol. The others were, if they had an, an uh, allergy to oxycodone, then they either got hydrocodone or codeine. And then they evaluated uh, them um, just in the first um, four hours after they gave them the dose and found that before surgery, they all com complained of very severe pain, average pain score of almost nine, and sorry, two hours, not four hours, and there was no difference in pain between groups, with both reporting a 50% reduction in their pain, which is quite significant. That's a great improvement. So NSAID, Tylenol, same reduction in pain, even in acute pain. But for surgical pain, clearly, there's nothing better than opioids, right? I mean, my, my career is predicated on this, right? I give <laughs> opioids only secondary to propofol, right? It's actually been looked at, which is kind of surprising to me. Um, Meta-analysis done of every study that's compared opioids and non-opioids are looked at um, the reduction of pain. So they're looking here for the number needed to treat to achieve a 50% reduction in your pain score. All the ones that are circled in red are opioids. The top one is a COX-2 inhibitor. The second one is ibuprofen and Tylenol at uh, 400 milligrams and one gram. The third one is ibuprofen and Tylenol at 200 milligrams and 500 milligrams. Number needed to treat just over one to achieve a 50% reduction in pain. So, Immediate post-surgical pain, opioids better, maybe not. But when you put people on opioids who have chronic pain, over the long term, they do better, right? I mean, clearly, we wouldn't give it if this weren't the case, right? I mean, the whole purpose of giving somebody a pain medication is they come to you and they're saying, I hurt, I can't golf, I can't go to work. And so you give them a therapy with the intention to reduce their pain, improve their disability, improve their functionality. And we wouldn't continue to do it if that weren't demonstrated. Well, it turns out that's exactly what we've been doing for the past 15 years. So when you look at long-term use of opioids, this is one of the favorite studies that I've come across. It was published in 2006 from Denmark. And I uh, wish we would have paid attention to it then. They did a survey of their entire population, and out of them they had over 10,000 patients who were on chronic opioids, 
and they compared them to the rest of the population and came up with some findings that at first blush, you know, aren't surprising, right? So people who are on opioids chronically were more likely to complain of moderate or severe pain. They were more likely to rate their own health as poor. They were more likely to not be employed. They were more likely to use more healthcare resources. And they had a lower score on their quality of life, right? And you look at it and you say, well, of course. I mean, they're on opioids because they hurt a lot. And they have these scores because they hurt a lot, right? But again, going back to, well, why are we giving the therapy? And in their conclusion, they make a statement that I think should be the, the topic for every time you think about doing an opioid or you're evaluating somebody for opioid. And they make this observation that it's remarkable that opioid treatment of long-term non-cancer pain does not seem to fulfill any of the key outcome opioid treatment goals, not pain relief, not improved quality of life, not improved functional capacity. So if it doesn't make you better, then should we be using it? And for people who are already on it, if you take it away, are we harming them? Right? That's the other question. Are we hurting patients that are already there by trying to get them off? Um, the NIH sponsored a, a study that was published recently trying to answer this question as they've been more interested in the opioid crisis. So they looked at 39 studies looking at long-term opioid use, and looking at all of these, they find in, that they cannot find evidence to support the benefits of using it. It's not there. There's no compelling evidence that patients are better because they use their opioids. However, there's a lot of evidence that says that we're harming them. So no evidence that they're getting better, evidence that they have um, risk for overdose, risk for abuse, increased fractures from um, poor bone health, increased myocardial infarctions, sexual dysfunction. So we're finally looking at the question we should have looked at before we started doing this and finding out that not only are we probably not helping patients, but we, we're probably making them worse by what we're doing to them. So when you're working with patients, you know, sometimes you say, well, this doesn't make sense, right? They come to you, they're on opioids, you talk to them about their opioids, you say, what happens, you know, how do you feel when you take your opioids? And they'll simultaneously say, well, I don't get any relief, but I need them, right? And they say they feel horrible if they don't take them. And that's not a lie, right? In our minds, we were thinking that it was this, right? So they come to you in pain, that's their baseline state. They take the first opioid, they get a little analgesia, they get a little euphoria, they feel better, their mood's better, their anxiety's gone, you know, they just overall feel better, they have a little dope. And then it goes away and they go back to the baseline, right? So they do it again. And they continue to take opioids. And as they continue to take opioids, that euphoric effect and that analgesic effect starts to get minimized. And so you increase the dose. And you keep going. And as they increase those and go over time, not only are they needing more to get up to the top, but their baseline changes. Where instead of being at their normal baseline of what they're experiencing with pain, their baseline becomes a withdrawal state where they're dysphoric, where they have increased pain, more acute pain than they had than they were experiencing before, this hyperalgesia. And so people that are on chronic long-term opioids are kind of in a chronic state of withdrawal. And when they tell you, if I don't take them, I feel horrible, they're absolutely right, because they're living here. If they don't take it, they absolutely feel horrible. That does not mean that they're getting a benefit from their opioids. It means that they need it to get to baseline function, to get back to where they were before we gave them opioids. When you look at um, the idea of hyperalgesia, it's a fairly controversial idea, um, but there are studies that have looked at this directly. One of them, uh, I'm gonna talk about two of them. Um, these are patients that were on just maintenance methadone um, for addiction. They weren't chronic pain patients per se. And so they uh, took these patients, they actually did serum studies on each patient to determine where their peak and their troughs were of their methadone. And they took a, a super cold ice bath and they stuck their hands in it. 
and they timed how long they could keep their hands in the ice bath, and they compared it to normal people that weren't on any opioids. People who were on methadone had way less tolerance for pain and having the ice bath. This is the trough. At their peak methadone, where they're supposedly getting the most analgesic benefit at it, they had some improvement, but still way less tolerance <laughs> than non-opioids. The other study was a study done by a pain physician who, while he was doing procedures on his pain patients, asked them to rate their pain um, when he gave them one cc of subcutaneous lidocaine. You've all given lidocaine, you know it hurts when it goes in. And so he had them just rate the pain experience when he gave the lidocaine into their skin. This is opioid naive. This is zero to 10 mill equivalents of opioid a day and increasing doses of opioid to greater than 200. So even on small dose opioids, patients had increased pain to a painful response. They actually hurt more because they're on opioids than people who are not on opioids. <coughs> so what happens when we take people off opioids? There aren't great studies. This is a, a review of 40 studies that um, they mostly found were of really poor quality and you couldn't get much information out of them. Of the ones that were fair quality, which is the, the highest rating that any study got, um, when the ones that looked at pain severity, eight out of eight of the fair quality studies that looked at it reported improved pain when you took them off their opioids or decreased their opioids. Of the studies that looked at it, five out of five showed improvement in function and three out of three showed improved quality of life just by taking away their opioids. That's all they did. So, pain's a problem. It's not gonna go away. I wish I could stand here and say we found the solution, um, but we haven't. Um, I'm a little skeptical that we will in the long run because it turns out your body really, really wants to be able to feel pain. There are redundancies upon redundancies in the system and all the attempts that we try to do of blocking it in the long term, your body doesn't like. It has negative side effects and consequences. So can we ever take away pain? Uh, maybe, I don't know. But opioids aren't the answer. Not only are we not actually getting better success compared to other modalities that we have, but we're probably making their life worse by giving them opioids. And it's a hard thing to look back and, and see because I was part of that too. There are a lot of patients who've come through surgery on high dose opioids that I took care of after surgery and they went home on a higher dose opioid than they came in on, right? But when you look at the evidence, this is the only conclusion I can come to, that there's no benefit and we're probably doing them harm. So then what? Well, for me, um, in my specialty, acute pain, um, I've always been interested in that perioperative pain time. When I was in the military, I worked um, with the veterans that came back with really horrible injuries. They would have dozens of surgeries over the course of months, and pain was a horrible problem for them. And I was involved in a team that helped manage their pain in, in the long term. And um, we didn't do a great job of it, but it raised some questions for me of, um, in our traditional acute pain model as an anesthesiologist, I never see the patient until the day of surgery. It's the first time I meet them. They come to me, they may be on, they may be, have abuse history, they may be on Suboxone, they may be on high dose opioids, I may be, get called about them because they're in the PACU and you guys can't control their pain and you're gonna call me to come help, right? First time I meet them. The longest we'll take care of them is while they're in the hospital and then they leave and we're done. Never have anything to do with them ever again. You guys see him for a few weeks, decide surgery's healing well, and you're done, right? You're not gonna prescribe, continue to prescribe opioids for him. And then they go off and they're still suffering, they're still hurting, and they go to their primary care provider who says, well, I don't really know what to do. You just had this big surgery, you're telling me you're hurting, yeah, I'm gonna continue your opioids, right? We're, there was a gap we were missing. And so the idea was to try to close that gap. And so what we, what we did is we developed a team that first looked at as soon, identifying patients as soon as you indicate them for surgery. So you sit down and say, yep, you need a new knee. I wanna know about it that day. And then we look at their history, we contact them, and we 
try to start working with them before surgery to see if there are things that we can modify before they ever have surgery that'll affect them afterwards. During surgery and while they're in the hospital, fairly standard um, with a couple exceptions that I'll talk about. And then after surgery, we follow them for a long time. We call them at two weeks, excuse me, two days, five days, seven, 10, 14, 21. <coughs> Continue to call them if they're still not off their opioids. If they are, we still call them two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. Um, kind of follow up that I've never been involved with after surgery. It's been fascinating, it's been eye opening, um, and it's really facilitated what we've been trying to do. So, what is it? The transitional pain service consists of an anesthesiologist, a nurse practitioner, uh, Kim, who's up here in front, who's the heart and soul of the service, um, with over 10 years of chronic pain experience coming to us. Um, we currently have two nurses and a psychologist on the team. We started in January of this year. We received funding from the whole health program and started enrolling patients in January. We have over 180 patients we've enrolled into our service so far. Um, all of them, almost all of them orthopedic patients. We do accept some other um, patients from other services that have issues that are on Suboxone, they have substance abuse, and they request our help and we do it. So this is our team. We also have an informatics specialist who has been critical in how we use our data and um, developing our dashboards I'm going to show you. So the program, um, I detailed a little bit, and I'm just going to point out that uh, the, the job of the psychologist, I showed you before that people that continue to struggle with pain afterwards tend to be people that have mental health issues, right? We've never looked at trying to modify that in acute pain or around surgery, ever. And so the job of our psychologist is to start working with them before surgery. She introduces mindfulness sessions for people that have abuse histories and other things. She'll do um, ex acceptance and commitment therapy matrix um, before they ever have surgery. We start on this. While they're in the hospital, she gives them daily sessions. After they leave the hospital, she does outpatient sessions with them. So this is a novel intervention. I'm just going to skip this because I'm kind of running out of time. Um, I talked about our follow-up. When we developed this program, I think we were very thoughtful about how we were going to do it and what data we wanted to collect. So we actually developed a system where by um, assigning what are called health factors um, to certain measures in our notes, in our daily notes, we're collecting data on the um, promise scores, which is a self-reported measure of pain and um, pain interference and physical function, pain catastrophizing, their MMEs, um, their pain scores, their physical activity, what other conditions they have, how long does it take them to get off opioids, how many opioid tablets did they take, how many did they have left, all this data we're collecting in our routine notes that we're doing. So we take that data and um, Shardul, Shardul Patel, our informatics guy, um, developed a dashboard for us. So this dashboard has every single patient in our service. You click on a patient's name and you get this summary sheet that shows what surgery they had, a little bit about their history, their risk factors, um, if they're on opioids currently, uh, if they're not, when was the last day of opioids? And then we also get to see trends, data that I've never been able to see or look at in patients before. This is a patient that had two total knee replacements, one in February and then the other knee in May. And we can actually look and see what his post-operative course was. That's, these are MMEs, so morphine milligram equivalents. So the line of surgery, that's his MME and all the points we followed him and where he tapered down to zero. And then he went and had another surgery, had a different experience, which you guys probably already knew this. Um, it's like giving birth. It's never the same twice, right? Just because they had a great experience the first time doesn't mean that their pain's gonna be great uh, the second time. Same thing with him, he really struggled after. So he had more opioids and we got him off. This is the NIH uh, Promise Pain Intensity <laughs> Score. So while he's going through recovery, we know how he rates his pain. We know pain interference, so this is how much pain interferes with his activity. We can track this during his entire recovery and what's happening at different points, um, along with the physical function and then the pain catastrophizing scale. This is a patient 
uh, who came to us with a pre-op MME of over 300. Um, when you talk to him, um, he was pretty miserable. Um, he actually was taking this medication for pain not related to his surgery. This is an orthopedic spine case. But his pain that he was having, he took this for, wasn't related to his surgery. Um, he was miserable. His daughter had a little baby. He had a little granddaughter that his daughter wouldn't let stay with him because she didn't feel like he wasn't, was able to um, respond to her needs because of the effects of the opioids he was on. And he expressed the desire to us to try to come off. So he said, sure, we can help you with that. So right after surgery, much lower MME, and he was doing well. He was feeling good. And he said, you know, I want to keep going. So we helped him with the paper. He decided on his own just to go cold turkey. And we have veterans that just tend to do this. They just say, I'm done, and go off, which you don't recommend. Went through withdrawal, showed up his primary care provider. While he was in withdrawal, she gave him a little opioid. And he continues to be on this lower dose of opioid. Now, he drives, bought a motorcycle, goes for walks. He has his daughter, his granddaughter come over and stay overnight with him. Never been able to do that before. When he talked to his daughter, she says he's different. He's the dad that I used to have. He's not groggy all the time. He's not irritable. Um, just from taking off his opioids. Again, this wasn't the surgery because he was taking opioids for something not related to his surgery. This is just getting him off opioids. You say, well, okay, we got him off. Is he suffering more? Well, we can, we can look at that. Are we hurting him? Here's his pain severity scores. It jumped up when he went cold turkey off his opioids. That happens when you're going through withdrawal. You get an increase in pain. And then, over time, it gets better. His pain interference substantially improves. This is, these are T-scores. So a T-score of 50 is um, average for a population. A change in 10 is one standard deviation. A change from 72 to 60 is a substantial <coughs> um, physical function scores, right? So we didn't hurt him. He's not worse. He's better. We can show this. This is a patient who came to us with a substance abuse history on naltrexone um, injections that she gets monthly, and that's how she got clean. And she'd been clean for a while, and she was really, really worried that she was going to have surgery, have a lot of pain that was not controlled, or she'd get pain medications and relapse into her abuse. This was a really big concern for her. And so we worked with her extensively before surgery. We came up with the plan, and we actually did a completely non-opioid surgical experience for her. She never received a single opioid. And did extraordinarily well with it. And you can say, great, so she did that. These are, that's her enemy, right? So no opioids at all. Um, but did she suffer for it, right? Was this a miserable experience? Well, fascinating. It doesn't look any different than our post-operative course on any of our other total knees. She wasn't in agony. She actually did pretty well. Her pain scores were great. Her pain interference improved. Um, did really well. A total knee replacement without a single opioid. So again, when we go back and say, do we, do we really need it? How much do we need? What do we need? Uh, those are questions we need to answer. And I'm just going to go um, quickly, um, just to review for um, 2017, new opioid use, 5.6% at six months, 36% of opioid users pre-op that came to us um, stopped opioids after. This is our current data. We have 150 patients that have been enrolled uh, for over three months, so they're at least three months out from surgery. The number on opioids before, uh, 26 27%, which is about the same as what our historical control was. Completely off opioids of those group, almost 50%. Those that we haven't been able to get off opioids, 14 of the 40, or 35%, reduced their opioid dose. And um, our average decrease is about 60% in their opioid dose from pre to post-op. We have six of them that have returned to their preoperative baseline dose. One who is on a higher dose now than he was um, before surgery, and I'll touch on him really closely, or in a second. And then when you look at our opioid naive patients, we currently have zero patients who are opioid naive before surgery that are on opioids now. And so that's compared to 5 to 10%, 5% for us, 10% um, around the country, and we're bad zero. And so uh, here's our data initially 
It's a new program. We're still figuring out um, a lot of things of how we're going to approach. Um, but the initial data that we have is really promising and has uh, garnered some attention to the point that um, we now are hiring two more nurses, another nurse practitioner, and another psychologist so we can expand the service to everybody. And we're getting pressure um, from primary care providers who say, well, this is great for our surgical patients. When can you do this for the rest of our patients? And so it's obviously a need that is being filled, and it's been a lot of fun to uh, work with Jeremy and the orthopedic service. It's a lot of work, uh, but I think we've got to a place where we really make a good team, and I think there's a lot of potential in it. Um, just one last thing, that guy that increases opioid dose, we can, because of how we're collecting the data, I can look at him and say, what's going on, right? He had a total shoulder surgery here. He was on an MME of 20, had a total shoulder, tapered down to 15, was totally non-compliant with your guy's instructions, and ended up injuring his, his shoulder. He had a fracture around his implant, and so he had to have another surgery here. And after that surgery, um, he's not wanted to come off opioids, and his primary care provider yesterday just gave him another month's worth and so he's two months after this surgery, we're still working with him. Um, but I, I can see what's going on. I can actually look at this data because of how we're collecting data in our notes. We can pull this up and see what's going on with each individual patient. There's a, a gold mine of data and questions that, that I haven't even thought of. I think we can answer um, with how we set up our program. Um, I think it'd be really important to have not just anesthesia team, but the entire surgical team that's involved in the process um, that could be involved in, in coming up with questions to answer and how to answer them. And um, I'm going to end there because we're short on time and open it up to questions. recently, and Kim and Jake and, and know about this, uh, obviously, in details, we've, we, I mean, this is a question for you, is that, you know, we have this whole field of pain management, right, that's sprouted in the last couple decades, and now I think this data is rather compelling, there's this national opioid crisis, and, you know, we have this intervention um, with the, the TPS to try to help with this, and we're running into, at the VA, trying to get these patients involved in this service preoperatively and the, the non-transitional pain doctors but the actual pain doctors are fighting back hard against us by saying, what are you why are you telling our patients that opioids are bad? And literally, I mean, Jay had an email that uh, you know he shared with me over the last couple of days on a couple of our patients that, I mean, it is absolutely astonishing what this pain doctor is telling him about you know, how he's wrong and how the opioids are actually good for these patients and why are you telling them this stuff? And so I think we're going to be, you know, what do you think about that? There's this whole field and, you know, yeah, you're well, anesthesiologists. It's, a, I mean, you're it's a big change in mindset <laughs> yeah. for all of us. It's hard. I, I still feel tugs when you tell somebody no that you're hurting them. You know, I imagine it's like when a family practitioner comes in and somebody's sick and they're wanting an antibiotic and you know they shouldn't have it, but they're begging you and telling you how much they're suffering and you feel bad to not give it to them. I think... It's hard to move away from that. And as far as the benefits of opioids, um, I'm pretty convinced. I've, I've, this wasn't my position as strong six months ago. Um, I think as time goes on, there will be, there will be no basis at, at all for, for people to start opioids for chronic pain. I think they will not be allowed. Yes, sir. Two small comments. One, the loss of Vioxx was tragic as a pain medicine. Uh, yeah. It was an orthopedist. Uh, yeah, yeah. We took that off the market for three deaths. How many yeah, have we killed I, with opioids? Yeah. I gave patients routinely Vioxx after total deaths. All the nurses said my patients on Vioxx had vastly less uh, use of opioids because it was a pain medicine. And I say this from personal experience as well. The second one was a, a friend of mine, 260-pound, not fat guy, who had an operation on his neck. I talked to him afterwards, and I said, what's he on? And he said, a lot of it. And I said, how do you like it? And he says, I like it a lot. And I said, why? And he says, he, he began by saying, do 
you ever have those orgasms? And I said, yes. And he said, how long do they last? I said, not very long. He said, how would you like to have a 20 minute non nomad orgasm from the lot? And I thought that sounded really good in a certain sort of way. And I was frightened of the whole idea because orgasms get me in enough trouble as is. And I thought there was something in that in certain patients that was scary. Yeah. There's no question when you look at this, and when we talk to patients who are having a hard time coming off, it's almost never because of pain. When you drill it down, it's almost never because they need it for pain. They say, it helps me sleep better, they have a crappy situation at home, and they're not happy, and it provides some relief, it provides an escape. And that's why I mentioned when you look at like varicose veins, right? they're not having pain still, it's they took the medication, they really enjoyed the experience, and they keep taking it. Yeah. yeah. One other minor problem is, pain is never objective. Yep. So you can't do studies, because you have nothing to measure that's objective. The closest thing I've ever heard is that cold water business, and then you're measuring tolerance. Yep. And a distance runner is going to be better at it than right. a lot of other people. It's one of the reasons I oftentimes, instead of saying pain, talk about pain suffering. We're, we're not really trying to affect their pain. We're trying to affect reducing their suffering that they have during the process. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little about what triggers you think there are for converting the human yeah, well, that's that's really complicated. Um, there are there there yeah there are there are a lot of biochemical things that go on both in the periphery when you have an injury that change your the the numbers and types of receptors on your nerve surface that make it so that you need a lower um, act, or lower stimulus to create the action potential and that can be propagated and become a chronic thing peripherally. There are changes that happen centrally that also inhibit the, the descending um, inhibitory pathways, right? So we get pain signals all the time and our brain blocks them, we don't experience them. Um, you affect that descending inhibitory pathway and so that you, the signals that are coming from the periphery you experience more strongly than you would otherwise. And these are modeling changes that happen sometimes acutely and sometimes over time with pain that um, leads the, the acute pain to turn into this chronic pathologic pain, right? The, the stimulus is gone, the, the wound is healed, but they're still having pain from it. We don't know how to modify that. Um, we just, we haven't, haven't got there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because when you look at the predictors of the people that develop chronic pain, um, what we've looked at is mental health. It's hard to, we don't have the genes studies to look at um, at this point. To, to, um, but the fact that you have somebody who, because of their mental health conditions, are more likely to get there, um, it makes sense to me. When, you guys are all orthopedic surgeons, so you're jocks, right? Um, you go out, you're mountain biking, you're having a great time, you finish your ride, you look down, you have blood dripping down your leg. You go, I don't even remember when that happened. Right? Your body has this powerful ability to, to stop that. Conversely, my daughter, when I talk to her about going and getting a shot, is in hysterics before she's ever touched by a needle. By the time she gets the injection, you would think we were actually ripping her arm off. Right? Your body also has the ability to ramp up your perception of pain. Um, can we influence that? Maybe. We're trying to. Um, can we predict otherwise? Not that I know of. We can't, they, we can't, there are some people that don't have these problems from opioids, don't seem to have these problems from opioids. I don't know how to predict that. One more thing I want to say before time runs out that I didn't really get to. I think 
you know, the question is, what, what do I think actually is making this impact? And I would say probably two things. One is talking with them beforehand, providing education about what to experience. And we talk about, you're going to hurt, and it's okay. That's okay. You've been hurting for years. You're going to hurt after surgery, and it's okay. You'll be fine. Um, and this is the reason we use opioids. This is the reason we're not going to use opioids. If you're not on opioids before surgery, you are going to be off within this time frame. And we have that discussion before surgery, right? So we've been able to provide education, set expectations, and then the follow-up afterwards. Um, we couldn't do it without the frequent follow-up. Our patients aren't enrolled in them, they are specific to a case study, but we've been at conferences about you know, our osteoporosis and, and other students have said that their patient is one of the most painful uh, um, operations the patient can receive. And I just stood up at the meeting and said that's absolutely not the experience that our patients have had. So I don't know what it is that they're doing, and I always talk about when we have this great pain team at the VA. But we are definitely seeing something different in just our periodic care that other groups are not experiencing. And we just technology and stuff. Okay. I wanted to say two things. One is that patients, there are two things. One is trust, and two is that communication. So it's a two way relationship between the patient. The, the patients trust our team and they trust your team and they trust that we have a good relationship with your team and that we are going to communicate and we are going to get the job done and that they have expectations and that we're going to meet those expectations together and that you're on board and we're on board with a common goal to take care of them safely and that, that the patient is always first, always and that we will take care of them and we always have their back and that we have each other's back. And I will always, always never throw anybody under the bus and we will always have each other's back. And patients always know if I have an issue, Patrick knows, I will, and Dad knows, I will walk up to the clinic, I will take care of an issue, and I will, we will get back to that patient that day. And patients know that and they learn to count on that and therefore they trust and they they start their tapers and they trust in that. And I think when they have that working relationship, they know that we, they, we have their best interest in heart and they follow the plan. And I think that's how we, we're successful. Do we have low blocks and bumps? Absolutely. But I think at the end of the day, the patients feel that we care about them and that we have a good team. And I think we are moving forward, and even if there are other people that don't believe in what we're doing, um, I think ultimately we will take the best care of the patients, and that's what it's all about. With that, thanks guys for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for letting me come.